Hey, there are so many great stories behind the people that lead worship for us every weekend here at First Baptist Orlando, and today you're going to get a chance to hear one of them, so don't go anyplace. Thank you for joining us here at First Orlando Talk, the show where life and faith come together. So I'm here today with one of our worship pastors here at First Orlando. In fact, he's been a worship pastor with us since 2009. He is the husband of 21 years to his wife, Angie. He's the father to three, three great kids, Jack, Foster, and Audrey. And my guest today is Robert Elkins. Robert? Yes, sir. Thanks for being here Thank today. You. Pleasure to be here. So listen, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I usually ask something right off the bat marriage-related uh, and I'm going to do that today, but the question's going to be a little bit different because on Instagram, if I've seen one picture of a date night with you and Angie, I've seen at least 15 of them. So what's the secret of a date night and a 21-year marriage? Are those, are those two go hand in hand or what's, what's that about? Well, living in Orlando, you have to go to Disney World, right? And uh, so we um, find a way to do that. <laughs> Uh, often on our date nights, and uh, but so my wife loves Disney. She loves um, spending time together, and so it's a priority. Yeah, and that's probably the biggest thing is is that it's something that we intentionally try to do, intentionally set aside the time aside to do, and um, you have to you have to schedule it. You have to look at your calendar, just like at the beginning of the month, and we're saying, okay, what's going on this weekend? The kids are doing this, this recital, and this concert, and this trip. Well, when are we going to have our time? When are we going to have our date night? And so it's just part of the planning, and it's important to do that. And um, my wife, she's my best friend. She's we met in in college in seminary, and so she was already there pursuing ministry. She was called to ministry, um, and so as a pastor. As a minister, having someone like that who herself being called separately um, is a great partner in ministry. Yeah. And so she understands what the pastor's going through, you know, what a pastor's going through. She can relate. She's encouraging. She's supportive. And um, now, fortunately, our kids are old enough to where they can kind of watch themselves. <laughs> and we have the, the margin to be able to, to step away. Yeah. And, yeah. ha- and have that time. You got to you have to create that margin though, because if you're not if you're not intentional on doing that, that that time could slip away from you. It's all intentional, and it's kind of how I've treated uh, treated my even my quiet times with the Lord mm-hmm. is to you know I, we're big on our planners and on you know our calendars and getting all the to do lists down and but how often do we put on there <laughs> time with the Lord, time with our spouse? Yeah time with our kids, whatever it might be. We put we put on there all these appointments and meetings and the things we have to get done and we don't miss those times. We keep we honor those appointments. Well how much more to put on there? I've, I started putting on my calendar, you know, this hour that I'm going to spend time with the Lord. And again, just being intentional and putting on the calendar, here's the night we're going to go on a date or whatever it might be. This is going to be a family night, a game night or Whatever it might be, this is time for the family. And if it's important, shouldn't we you know, make the time and be intentional just as we are with all the other things in our life? Yeah. And that's been a big help for me. Well, that could be a whole other talk because uh, oftentimes I feel like uh, a, a Martha. I, I want to be a Mary, but I live in a Martha world, mm-hmm. busy all the time, doing yes. things for the Lord, and it yes. feels good. But the Lord tells us there's one important thing, and Mary was doing that, and that was sitting at his feet, spending time with him. That's good. And that takes a lot of intentionality. So you talked about meeting Angie at seminary, but I want to back up some, because that makes perfect sense for you being a worship pastor or seminary. That all goes together. And I don't know the story, but I want to hear about how it happened. There's a point in time, you're actually at Virginia Tech. Uh, There is a student in electrical engineering. Yeah, yeah. And then the next thing is I look at some of your biography. I'm not stalking you, by the way, on Facebook, but I just wanted to find out a little bit more about you. You're at the uh, Berklee College of Music, Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, I'm not able to connect the dots. Yeah, sure. So what's the story behind how you end up as a student and getting your degree in electrical engineering, but then at some point I'm thinking shifting gears, or maybe there's something else to that about how you ended up at Berklee College of Music, and then, you know, what was the path after that? So tell me a little bit before how you got there, and then what's happened since then. Yeah, absolutely. It's a 
it's a unique journey and, and a journey that you would you probably wouldn't be able to script out yourself if you tried. It's truly God was leading me every step. I believe it. But it's it's just it's just how things things happen. I grew up, you know, studying music, drawn to music. My mom was the organist in my home church, so I was always drawn to it. My earliest memory sitting underneath the piano bench with her playing for a Southern Gospel Quartet. My dad would sing in it and she would play piano. And, and I just took the, to the piano right away. They saw that. I started taking lessons when I was six, took classical for years. And as I got into high school, my dad, you know, he's like, well, what are you going to do for, for college? I guess you're into music. Why don't we send you away for the summer to a school and just a music school and see how, how you like it, this, if you really want to pursue music. And so we're just flipping through a magazine. We just pick a keyboard magazine. We're just flipping through it. We have no idea what's out there, right? And my dad, he, he, he has no clue. He's a medical doctor, and he doesn't know music colleges. So we just happened to flip through a magazine and come across an ad for Berkeley College of Music in Boston. I'd never heard of it. And so my dad inquired, and they... And so we decided to fly up and... They do have a high school program, and we were going to interview for the high school program. I was like a sophomore in high school, okay. 16 years old. All right. And so we fly up there and interview, and the, and the guy there says, you already know everything we're going to teach the high, school, the high school program. I was blessed to have a great piano teacher, taught me a lot of theory. I loved math, and so theory uh, just kind of fit that, that, that mode. There is a connection. Music kind of uses both sides of the brain. It's, it's, it's artistic, it's emotional, yeah. it's expressive, but it's also technical and mathematical and detailed. And that's kind of always the part of music that I, that I gravitated toward. Uh, I love the, the technical, the details of it, the theory of it, the, um, the intervals and how they relate and all the different, the, the, the tuning and the temperament and all those technical terms of music. I've always been drawn to that. Um, so I, I was good in math, and, and I think that's part of the connection there. But um, So I, fortunately, I, the guy said, you already know everything we're going to teach because of your, your theory background. You already have been, been doing this. Why don't you come for the whole summer for our, and just take the college classes? Just come as if you're a first semester freshman. And so, I mean, I was 16. Were you auditing the classes in a sense? No, no, or I was... Getting actual credit. Okay. So, so we said, yeah, sure, why not? I, had, I really had no idea what I was getting into. So my dad's like, yeah, we're going to do this. And my dad's kind of like that. He's like, we're going to you know, push you off out of the nest and you're going to do this. I mean, actually, I, was, you know, I grew up in North Carolina. I'd never really been out of the state of North Carolina. And so he says, okay, here's a plane ticket to Boston, and here's the name of the lady going to pick you up at the airport. And that's how he sent me off to Berkeley for the summer semester. And you're in you're in Lumberton at the yeah, time. Yeah, so, so mean, Boston's a little different than I, Lumberton, North and, Carolina. And I didn't know any better to be scared or <laughs> and it's funny because now I have a sixteen year old. And for me to think about putting him on a plane and sending him off to New York City or Boston or some major city for for, for twelve weeks now, three months. And here's the name of the lady gonna pick you up at the airport. It's like really. Uh, so but that's my dad. I mean, he's just like push you on out, it's time for you to, to grow up. But I, I loved it. I mean, I had no idea. Again, I didn't know any better to, to be scared or nervous. Yeah. I just jumped yeah. right in. And all of a sudden, I found myself as a 16-year-old, you know, living in a dorm with a bunch of college kids and studying music. I mean, I, I loved it. I thought I was on top of the world. And it's interesting. There's a whole spiritual journey there of what God did during that time. Because I had the potential to, to, to totally reject God and not go to church. I mean, no, I didn't have mom there anymore saying, hey, it's time to go to church, mm. which I'd had my whole life. Yeah. So, so I could have totally turned my back on. I was 16. I had all the, I had all the freedom in the world. Nobody, nobody watching me. I could go and come, stay out as late as I want. I could sleep in. I could be drinking. I could be doing whatever. But God had his hand on me, and I, and I actually grew closer to God that summer than I had ever been, ever done before. So that could be another whole story, but... Do you think it was because of that uh, environment? Precipitated I, that, or I, it was just going to happen? I totally, I, I, that is part of it. I totally think God had his hand on me, mm -hmm. for one. 
he just he just prompted me to seek out a church, and through that I found some just on fire believers, college kids that were part of the college ministry that were just on fire that I'd never seen before. I mean, I was from sheltered North Carolina. Religion is part of the culture. There's a church on every corner. Nobody's really on fire. I mean, they are, but it's just not Probably something you observe. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and, and, but being in Boston, it's a dark place. And I was around these Christians that were going out feeding the homeless on the streets, and I'd just never seen anything like that before. And they taught me about quiet times, which I'd never really done before. They, they taught me how to grow in my faith. I'd never really been discipled which is kind of a part of, I think, what Baptists struggle in is discipling. We, we've always been so caught up on, on salvations mm -hmm. and getting people saved, but then we haven't been so strong in helping them take the next step and how do you grow. And I didn't really have anyone come alongside me to disciple me. Mm -hmm. So that started that summer in Boston. I had these college students that just took me under their wings and, and I just grew by leaps and bounds on the spiritual side. And then on the musical side, I also grew. I was introduced to music I'd never heard. Jazz and Chick Corea and Bill Evans and Oscar Peterson, Keith Jarrett, all these piano players I'd never heard about. I mean, I was so mad at my parents. I'm like, you <laughs> never exposed me to this. And fortunately, my 16-year-old knows all about that because I made sure. But um, I grew up around Southern Gospel. I didn't know anything about jazz. and But it was just like a new world. I mean, so musically... Just my world exploded, and I, and I was so drawn to the different genres I was hearing, different styles. I mean, I took it all in, and I loved every bit of it. And so I came away from that summer knowing two things. I mean, I knew at that point I did want to pursue music, and I knew I probably want to pursue ministry. I mean, I felt that summer for the first time God calling me to some sort of full-time ministry. I didn't know at all what it meant. Mm -hmm. But also felt like music was definitely something I wanted to pursue. So I came back to high school, which was a bit major downer. Can you imagine coming back to junior high school? I mean, I mean, high school, your junior year, after being in Boston for three months, having all that freedom for one thing. But now I'm back around, you know, all these juniors. Um, and so that was kind of a, 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 an interesting transition. But so, so I, I came back and... and Still going through high school, thinking about what I want to do. And, you know, my dad's a doctor, like I mentioned, and, and he's like, well, if you go and do music, what, how are you going to make money? What you, can you really support yourself doing that? And I just, I just didn't know enough to, to know what's, what's out there, what kind of job would I have. I, I didn't really know. So he suggested, why don't we just go, why don't you go and get kind of a general degree that you can always have you can always use, maybe you can fall back on it. If music doesn't work out, mm -hmm. why don't we go and just get, uh, you know, maybe a general degree. So we picked engineering. General degree. Uh, you know, electrical, <laughs> electrical engineering for that. I mean, yeah, that's just your typical well, you know, standard yeah, degree. Everyone right? pursues that. So. But, but like I said, I was good in math, and I loved the technical things, and I was into keyboards and synthesizers and technology, and I felt like, well, that might be a good tie, you know, electrical engineering. Maybe I'll go to work for a keyboard manufacturer one day or, or a music software company. Or there, I mean, technology was exploding then in the mid-'80s to early-'90s. and So I always felt like there was a connection. It, to me, it wasn't something just out of, out of left field. To me, I mean, again, music is technical, and music is there's a big music technology field out there that mm -hmm. is, continues to grow and has a major influence even on what we do here. And so I felt like the engineering would give me a background that I could, that maybe I could one day, you know, you know, do some technical things, maybe create the technology that will make music. Okay. Who knows? So, so you, you saw that still as an opportunity to still tie in the music some way, shape, or form. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. It was seemed to be a good connection between, you know, math. I felt like you know, was my strength and and music. And so, so I went to Virginia Tech and I did the four years of engineering. Um, but it was a struggle. I mean, I was restless the whole time yeah. because it wasn't where my, my heart was. I mean, every, every opportunity I was doing music or I was doing ministry, I, I was involved in a church. I was, I was playing for a church. I was in a choir. I was leading worship for, a, for the Baptist College uh, Student Union. I was doing, in the summers, I, I went back to Berkeley. I took another, I took my second semester at Berkeley while I was at Virginia Tech also took another summer to do to tour like the state of Virginia to do music missions. I, 
every chance I, I got, I was doing music, I was doing ministry. I just, engineering, I did not feel, you know, like, like this is where I need to be. Mm-hmm. It was just a, the whole time, just this, this underlying restlessness was there. So I finished that. I, I made it through the four years. I don't know how, but made it through the four years. And, and then I said, well, you know, maybe now it's time to go back to Berkeley and finish what I've started. I already had a year done. And Berkeley has music technology programs. Like I said, they have a music production, music engineering program. And so I, that's kind of what I was drawn to, synthesizers, programming synthesizers, you know, creating your own sounds, creating tracks, using software, things like that. I mean, Berkeley, as it turns out, was started by an engineer. Yeah. Well, once right. I discovered that, so I was thinking maybe there's some crazy there alternative go. track for there, engineers. There's a connection, <laughs> see. There's a connection with the music and the and the math, the technical things. So, yeah. so I went to, you know, I went back to Berkeley and I finished up and I did the music synthesis, music technology kind of concentration. But again, the whole time, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. I'd always felt called to, to to church, but all of my music ministers growing up. I was small town North Carolina, so all of them were either female or bivocational, both one or both. So I never saw a model of, hey, that's what I could be, that's what I could do. The term worship pastor wasn't really around at that time. What was around? What, would you have been a it choir was song, or? song leader song or leader. minister of music? Okay, that's that's that. Those were the things I heard most yeah. common. So I never had a model of, hey, you should serve in the church because this is what's available to you. I never. I never had anybody that told me that. So not until I got to college did I have a, a male music minister where, where I thought for the first time, hey, wait a minute, I guess maybe I could do that. Maybe I could, something that I could pursue. And um, so I felt, again, I didn't feel, I, I had no idea how this was going to work out. What was I going to do after engineering, after Berkeley, doing the music technology? I had no idea. So I finished Berkeley. And, and I started thinking about, well, maybe I could go get a master's in music technology. University of Miami has a program in that. I was look, maybe looking into that. And I was having a conversation with my mom. My mom's my spiritual mentor, but also musical, like I said. But she's more than that, my spiritual inspiration. And I was just talking to her, and I was like, I have no idea what to do. I don't know what, how, how's God going to use all this? And she said, well, I mean, where, where do you feel? Like, God is most pleased. Like, what are you? What do you do when you feel God is most pleased? That you feel most like I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is what God made me to do. And, That's a good question. and I was thinking, I was in, when I thought about, it, I was like, well, when I'm in church, when I'm when I'm in church, playing the keyboard or, or leading the song or whatever I'm doing when I'm at church, I feel God's pleasure. You know, I feel like you know that's that might you know that. I feel most satisfied. I feel like that's what God may be calling me to do. And so she said, well, if you feel like you're going to do anything in church work, you probably should go to seminary. What about, what about seminary? Because you need more training in church history and the church music. And I'd never, I'd not really had that background. All my background had been contemporary music. Berkeley's a very contemporary jazz school. So I didn't have the traditional uh, music training and, and traditional church music training so so yeah that felt like well let's pursue that and being southern baptist i, I knew about the southern baptist seminaries and i'd heard about southwestern in, in fort worth texas and um they have a dean they had a dean there at the time that was very into jazz music and, and valued that and wanted that to be part of the program so that kind of drew me to southwestern and so here we go from boston down to fort worth texas can i Ask you a question, and then we'll pick the story back up. Your your mom asked a very insightful question, oh, yeah. or a very good question. Yeah, yeah. But I want to take it just a step before that. You're in college. You know you're you're generally you feel like you're moving in the right direction, but you just don't still have this sense of this is it. What what sustains? Because I think that describes a lot of people. They yeah. they know that they're moving towards something that the Lord would have them to do, but man, this just isn't feeling like it. What sustained you through that time frame? Because I think a lot of people could start to question like, ah, oh, man, am I, am I getting close? Am I not? It's, you know, I think, I think a, a big part of it for me is you have to wait on God's time. Yeah. And, and what do you do while you're waiting? You just have to, 
you know, you, you've heard the term just grow, bloom where you're planted, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's what you have to do, and that's what I did. I mean, when I was at Virginia Tech, I had no idea what the next step was, but I knew I, I was here for this season, and I'm going to just get involved in as much as I can. I'm going to stay close to the Lord. I'm going to be able to try to hear what He says to me. I'm going to be able to try to see the circumstances that work themselves out around me. Just see, try to see His hand. In the things that are going on around me, the people that are that because it's there, the people that are around me that are speaking into me, yeah. the what I'm hearing in the in the community that I'm in and in the circles that I'm in, and I think you have to wait on God's time because when when it, for me my experience has been when it was right when it was time God showed me what the next step was, mm -hmm. but He never showed it to me before and it's and it's funny to think about. I look at my life as a as a 16 year old and. It, would God have said to me, "Okay, here's going to be your whole journey. You're going to go. For, you're going to go to Boston as in high school, and you're going to have this experience. And you're going to go to Virginia Tech, and then Boston, and then Texas, and then eventually to Florida." <laughs> I mean, would I, if I had known all that was coming? I mean, I don't know. Would I have, would I have stayed close to him? Would I have been, would <laughs> I have been desperate to know, God, what? What do you want me to do? What's the next step for me? I don't know what the next thing is for me. Hmm. I think we need to have that desperation at times where, because it keeps us close to, 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 to God. And, and that's where I found myself. I mean, every, every journey, I mean, I, I, I tried to stay in the moment, invested where I was, making the most of that opportunity, staying close to the Lord, listening to the people around me. And in time, God opened the door. I've never had to go and kick the door down. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't really think that's the way it's supposed to be done. I've mm -hmm. never had to go force my way mm -hmm. you know, through a door. I mean, God has always shown me this is the next door. Yeah. He, he's just not going to always show you right when you think you need to know. And, and, I, and I talk to students all the time. Like my son is 16. He's a junior in high school. And, and, and they, at, at his school, they're just drilling into him college prep and college prep, and you need to have your colleges start picking them out, go tour them in, the, in the, your junior year, you know, taking your SAT, your SAT and your ACT and all that. And, and he, I can see in him the stress of it. And I just want to try to tell him, you know, don't, don't let it take away the enjoyment of your last years of high school. Make the most of this season. Stay close to God. Stay desperate, listening to His voice, and He's and, and do all the things you're supposed to do. I mean, yeah, we're going to go visit school. We're going to have the schools in mind, but each step of the way, let God speak to you and show you. And it and if you don't know yet, just wait. Just just stay close to Him and wait. Bloom where you're planted. When the time is right, He's going to open the door. You're not going to have to go kick a door down. And that's happened to me. It happened to me going into Virginia Tech, going into Berkeley going down to seminary, going on to a church staff in Texas, and then coming on to a church staff here in Orlando. So after, every step after, of the way. After Southwestern, then you're in Texas. You I land in Texas. Texas. As a worship pastor or some other? Well, it's again, it's an interesting story. When I went to seminary, again, I didn't really know what I was going to do even in seminary. <laughs> I, did, I did not really ever plan to serve on a church staff because, I, again, I didn't have that model. I didn't know... Okay. what a worship pastor was. I've, I've always been kind of an instrumental guy and a technical guy. I'm into technology. I'm into keyboards, and I'm into instruments. And I'm not really an upfront, I've never really been an upfront kind of singer type, mm -hmm. which is what I've always seen of the music minister. And so I didn't think, is, is there any kind of job in a church for me, someone like, someone like me? So I got to Texas, and then I got introduced to the mega church. Everything's bigger in Texas, right? And so I, I, I realized there's, churches out there that, that are these huge churches that have multiple staff that need people who can do these different skills. And then that's exactly what happened to me. I had a church call me right outside of Dallas, and they said we're looking for a full-time, someone who can come in and just be our keyboard player and lead a band and arrange for us and orchestrate and write some charts, make some tracks for us, whatever it might be. And I was like, wow, that, that position actually exists, and that's full-time, and you can actually do that? And, and so that's where it started. And so I wasn't a worship pastor when I started on a staff. I was an associate worship, uh, worship associate doing kind of these detailed behind the scene jobs. And but God eventually kind of pushed me more and more, gave me a little more influence um, 
to where I became the worship pastor at that same church. I was there for 12 years and eventually became the worship pastor. Just outlasted everybody else, basically, <laughs> is what happened. But, but God, that's another whole big story of how God, and, and that's, again, something I was not pursuing. I was faithful doing what I was doing. I was making the most of, my, of that season, and God pushed me and created the circumstance to where I became the worship pastor, the, the main guy in charge of everything. And it's something I never, ever would have pursued and never, you know, every day it was like, God, what are you doing? And it, the funny thing is it made me desperate for God. It kept me close to him because I felt like this is totally out of my comfort zone. This is not at all what I feel like I'm, I've been trained for. But, but God, I think, I think at times God does that for us. He pushes us out of a comfort zone because when we're comfortable, we can, we can start to think we don't need God. Mm-hmm. And that was, that happened. That was happening to me. It's like, man, I'm so good. I mean, look at the skill I have. And people are, people are complimenting and our church is growing and our leaders, our senior leadership, you know, feels like this is a, a big part of why is what I'm doing. And I had so much pride and satisfaction, but God will come along and say, Hey, don't forget about me. And don't forget about who led you to have the experiences, to have the skill that you have. Stay close to me and stay desperate for me. And, and I'd lost some of that, and I think that's part of why God pushed me into a little more, a place of a little more influence to make me desperate for him. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's kind of where we were when we left, when we left Texas and, and then got called here to Orlando. And uh, I tell you, it's just been every step of the way, you know, God has just shown me, stay close to me, stay desperate for me, and I will, I will show you what to do. Mm-hmm. I, will, I will give you the circles of influence you need to have, and, and it's been true for me every step. You know, that's a, something that would resonate with all of us, mm-hmm. whether you're a worship or children's ministry, yeah. uh, mom or dad at home, I mean, just whoever you may be. I encourage my uh, people all the time with that. We have choir, you know, I work with choir members, orchestra members, living life with them, and they're always sharing about um, my job, you know, they're restless in their job, and and my boss is not a believer, and I'm struggling with that. What am I supposed to do? And, or, yeah, people with, with questions about, I have a, you know, I have a, a wayward teenager, or, or, or I have a child that's not close to the Lord, and, they, and they're not following in the, in the path that, that we grew, we, we raised them up to follow, and and what am I supposed to do? And all of our people are, are struggling mm-hmm. with, with something. I mean, it's funny how I, I have the perspective of up there on the platform looking out every week at all the people. And I, and I often try to just pick somebody that I can tell, you know, that person is struggling. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe this is the last Sunday and they're going home and they're going to divorce their wife. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've had it. Or, or they just... They just realized they have. They just went to the doctor and they they've been diagnosed with cancer, or their mother just passed away, or or their their teenage son just walked out of the house and they don't know where he is. I mean, that's going on every week in our. As I look out, right at the people, and that's what kind of keeps me, um, kind of focused on you know what I'm doing, on on the platform to where it, it doesn't just become rote and it just it, we're not just going through the motions. Every service. There's people there that are desperate, and 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 I, and I and that's my prayer every time. I'm just like Lord, whoever the, whoever it is, that person right there that looks like they're they're on the end. Just break through today, through through something that is about to happen. Break through that wall, mm-hmm. and uh, we and we live with our people, and and I'm always in just encouraging them. Just make the most of the season you're in. If you feel like you're, you're restless in your job. Just wait, wait for God to show you yeah. what to do. Bloom where you're planted. Mm-hmm. And what I'm hearing you say is, is that uh, God's hand is always involved. Uh, there's, so yes. there's a reason for every season. Yes. You may not know it. A lot of us don't know it. Yes. But there's a reason for that. God uses that. It. Well, and part of it's to keep you, by not knowing, to keep you desperate, seeking Him. Because yes. it sounds like, we can get in a comfort zone when we think we got this. Yes. We know what it's all about, what God wants us to do. Another thing you said I picked up on uh, that's just always really uh, great to remember, and I love what you said about picking people out in the audience and the people that you interact with. 
you're here because of your talent and skills, but there's no doubt that you're also here. This is the place that God's designated you to be at this time and at this place because the gospel and ministry also travels along relational lines. Mm -hmm. And it's not all just about music. It's about the relationships, and it's important that you are uh, have been, and it's important to you, I can sense that you also minister to the people that you're around, mm-hmm. not through music, just by being a brother in Christ, right. you know, and in concern. Some, some of the best advice I've gotten in ministry is we're in the people business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're in the people business, and you can't, you know, you, 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 and, and that's encouraged me because... Um, I, I am more of a behind-the-scenes guy. Like I said, I like to write and arrange and, and do little things here in my office, but I'm reminded it's about the people, and you cannot forget that. You're most, the most important thing I do is not the music. It is the people, the interaction, um, the encouraging, and, and the shepherding, and the leading, and the pastoring. It's all about, it's all about the people, and, and God's put that in there. He's placed those people before us, He's called us to be shepherds to them, and he's our model. He's our, he is the great shepherd. And every day I just try to say, Lord, who am I going to come across today? Who can I encourage today? That's a big thing I always ask. Lord, let me encourage somebody today mm-hmm. because um, we're, it's a broken world. We're all discouraged, and we need to be encouraged. So <laughs> that's, that was some great advice that someone gave me is we're in the people business. Yeah. There's a lot of other businesses that do a lot of other things well. We we do a good job here, but no one ought to beat us at being in the people business. Mm -hmm. No one ought to beat us at being in relationships. You know, you might have a better lighting system or sound system or some other thing. That's good. But you should never. We should never be top when it comes to uh, relationships. We're going to close it down here pretty soon. Um, I wanted to ask you. Two things. Uh, I'll give you five minutes, and then we're going to wrap it up. Uh, One, and you can answer these in any order, what's a verse that sustains you? I'm sure there's a lot, and that probably changes through seasons, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But today, now, with being a husband, a dad, a worship pastor, friend, brother in Christ, all these things, what's the verse that really resonates with you? And then just give me, because uh, you're you're going back to school now. You're pursuing your doctorate in. Yes. It's worship studies. Worship studies. Yes. Okay. And uh, I'd like to hear just a little bit more, because in my I'm not a worship guy. So you say worship studies. I'm thinking you're just going to go study more about mm-hmm. music and whatnot. Uh, gosh, that makes me want to ask you what your definition is about well, worship. <laughs> this could go another yeah, hour. Yeah. yeah. Well, but I we'll have to do a part two. Right? Uh, so let me, you know what, scratch all that. Let me ask you this question because worship's been a part of your life. We see you on stage. We know you're a worship pastor. Uh, if we're not careful, we think about you or kind of just box you into worship only, and you're a lot more than that. You've just shared worship is much more than that. How has worship intersected your life? I mean, the, the two go hand in hand. You're both. What's, how does yeah. one influence the other? Yeah, I mean, worship to me, it's not music. Music is a part of it, but but worship is 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 a lifestyle, and that's that's you know one of the, I think one of the values of this of our church is actually I think that might be exactly one of our values is that worship is a lifestyle. It's every moment, every day, every step, and it's basically a, a heart posture. Um, Romans twelve tells us um, present your body as a living sacrifice. Mm-hmm holy and acceptable, and this is your spiritual act of worship, present yourself as a living sacrifice. You know, sacrifice is a big deal. God loves sacrifice. We don't. Right. (laughs) God loves sacrifice. And if you look at worship in the Old Testament, there was always a sacrifice involved. I mean, sacrifice is at the heart of it. And that's something I ask myself often, what am I sacrificing today? And so to me, it's just always having that heart posture of, you know, the, the animal, when they came to be sacrificed, I mean, the animal didn't have a, a say pretty much, right? I mean, the animal just was kind of had to be poured out and had to just submit to the will of those that were there. And that's a, that's a picture for us. When we, 
we, when we're a living sacrifice, we have to just be in a posture continually of surrender, of saying, God, what do you want? It's not about me. It's about you. It's about your kingdom. It's about your glory. It's about your story. It's not about me. What can I do to contribute to that today? What can I do to sacrifice? I might have to give up time or, or resources or whatever it might be, but I, I am going to give you today my heart, my life. I am a living sacrifice today. And so that, that to me is what worship is. It's, it's, it, that verse is, you know, we love that verse in worship world, but it's just a great uh, a life verse. You know, present yourself a living sacrifice. And every day that's what we are to be, just offering ourselves to God every moment. It's not just when we're on the platform singing a song. It's every moment we are that living sacrifice, mm. completely surrendered to the hand of God. Amen. That's a good word. I think yeah. we're going to end it on that one awesome. right there. I appreciate you being here today yeah. and just sharing your story. Man, it's always just so cool to get to know folks. You know, it, it's about being relational. That's mm -hmm. where we discover one another and our journeys in Christ and where they intersect or where they parallel, you know, yeah. however he has working out for us. Um, and thank you today for tuning in to First Orlando Talk. Again, it's a show where life and faith Come together while you're at it. If you would, hit the subscribe button and then the notification button so that you can be alerted to when we have other talk shows like this and discover more about us here at First Baptist Orlando. We appreciate you for watching. Thank you. God bless and have a great day.